Richard van der Blom is on a mission to help sales and marketing teams leverage the world of LinkedIn for brand awareness. His personal following on LinkedIn exploded after publishing the fourth LinkedIn algorithm report in 2022. Richard gives away a lot of knowledge, and he gets a lot in return for that. His business grew exponentially, and he became an international keynote speaker. So I think it's time to check in with this Dutchman living in Spain. Welcome to the Own Your Story podcast, the place to learn about personality branding, thought leadership, and how to capitalize your reputation. In other words, how to own your story. I'm your host, Bianca Vleerakas, former actress, turned into six-figure entrepreneur, author, and keynote speaker. Let's get started. But on the other hand, I still have the impression that a lot of people uh, think about LinkedIn as a Rolodex. As the online yeah, CV. As, as, yeah. yeah, as a Rolodex or, yeah, you mentioned it even worse, as their CV, you know, that you don't look at it unless your boss mm-hmm. tells you that your job is at risk and then in in blind panic, you're going to open your LinkedIn profile and update something until you find a job again and then it's yeah. like, okay. Yeah. Um, and I always, at least in my sessions, if people still are on that page, I always try to explain to them that that's probably not a very good idea because, um, you know, if you talk about personal branding, I think 80% of your personal brand is done online and 20% is done offline because in order to meet people and to show people, to demonstrate people your personal offline brand, they first need to find you. They Mm -hmm. need to contact you. They need to be convinced to invite you. And that's all done digitally. So Mm -hmm. people Googling your name, 96% ends up on your LinkedIn profile. So if that's like no more than your curriculum vitae, I think you have a big branding problem already Mm -hmm. there. Now, at the beginning, you uh, gave trainings in Facebook in how to work with Instagram yeah. probably as well, yeah. LinkedIn too. And at a certain moment, you decided to focus on LinkedIn only. Yeah. Probably because you wanted to become a specialist or what was the reason? No, no, no. I think that's, that's the most important reason. And uh, quite frankly, because I really hated all the other platforms. So... <laughs> Um, and I know I agree I well, agree I, yeah but I hope some of my clients back then are not listening because I really noticed I mean we started as a b2b social media training consultancy agency so yeah Facebook Twitter blog training later we had Instagram and I, I really remember the days that I was driving in my car to my client because they asked me to provide them with a Facebook training or Twitter training And I always felt that I was not the right person to give the training, not because Mm -hmm. of my knowledge, but because of my attitude and my own uses of the platform, you know? So I was always like showing other people's uh, profiles as an example and telling the people what I wanted to hear. I I, I would provide them with insights, but it was never from, from my heart, from my own usage. And Opposite to when I had a LinkedIn training and I was there being very enthusiastic and say like, wow, I've done this. Have a look at what I've done. So I, I, I remember like, how do I feel if I give a LinkedIn training? I feel very enthusiastic. I really have uh, a good day. And then mm-hmm. opposite to when I have other kinds of trainings. Yeah. That's the first reason. And then the second reason, I looked at our business with, at that time, a business coach. And I saw that we were not doing bad, but we only had clients that would spend on average like two, three, four thousand euros with us, and then they would move to a specialist. Okay, so we would raise the floor, and then it would say, okay, now we get the base of Facebook, and then they would go to a Facebook agency, which I, mm-hmm. I, I perfectly understand. And that was the moment when I realized I don't want to be the generalist; I want to be the specialist on LinkedIn. So that's when I, as a company owner, said to my colleagues. And my employees, okay, we're going to 100% focus on LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. And, and quite frankly, it's one of the best decisions I have ever made. Yeah, because that's one of your quotes. I really like that one. Uh, as you say, people like generalists, but they pay specialists more. Oh, you remember that? You've seen that? <laughs> yeah, I've seen it's... that because, because I, I, uh, uh, I, it's the truth. Um, it is. It but is. I think it's unfortunately it's the truth because there's a lot of worth in in generalists as well, uh, a lot of worth, and not just to be the basics to to offer the basics in things, but in leadership, for example, our generalists can be much more interesting than than yeah. being a specialist, I, for example. Yeah, I, I I completely agree. No, I was surprised that you mentioned this quote because. Um, 
over the last year, I have stepped up, uh, stepped up my quote uh, content. <laughs> so I've, I've shared quite a few. And there are much more that a lot of people always refer to than this one, this specific one, which yeah. I also really like because it's yeah. true. It's true um, yeah. I think as a leader, probably you will be better off as a generalist than as a specialist because mm -hmm. you need to know from everything yeah. a bit, you know, to be able to, to, to manage things and to be able to understand the challenges of your co-workers, employees or clients. But um, in our team, for example, um, we have about eight specialists and I think about four generalists, okay? And I really value the generalists because they always have the good ideas. They always know everything about, but if I really need to solve a problem or a challenge, I always go to the specialist mm -hmm. because, hey, yeah. you are our specialist on LinkedIn advertising. So I know a, yeah. a lot of it, but now I go to you because this yeah. client wants to have his business like solved. Yeah. So um, yeah, I, I totally agree with that one. So you need both, but you have to pay yep. them equally. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and that's, that's funny because like I mentioned in the quote, people like generalists, but they often pay for specialists yeah, because yeah. I think they can see the direct value of a specialist while a generalist yes. is more on a strategic level. Yes. Yes, completely. I agree. Now, um, so you became a specialist in LinkedIn, uh, which, yeah, it's, it's a choice. But for me, that's a question as well. Why do you want to become a specialist in a tool that isn't yours? It makes you very depending on the policy, on the algorithm, on the, it offers you features every month, new features. So you, you do have content to share every time. There's, there's, there's a, an unlimited source of content, of course, but it makes you dependent on a software, on a product that isn't yours. Yeah. So, and I know, I know why you ask me this and i know also that a lot of people on linkedin look at me this way but in fairness i am more i'm seeing myself more as a specialist in how to grow your business mm -hmm. or how to stand out as a thought leader mm -hmm. and one of the tools or one of the channels at this moment is linkedin which happens to be my preferred channel which mm -hmm. happens to be a channel where you can see uh, in a very reasonable time, a lot of positive results. Mm -hmm. But um, I was just in August, I was uh, speaking on two events. One was about thought leadership. One was actually about marketing. And yes, I talked about LinkedIn, but I noticed that like half of my slides were not about LinkedIn. It was about attitude. It was about changes in marketing, changes in how people look to thought leadership um, also how you can make your personal brand work offline. So I'm well aware that if LinkedIn stops tomorrow, that 60% of my business needs to be like, okay, rebuilt. But I'm already moving to a yes. point where I say like LinkedIn is the channel now, but if, if yeah. something comes up like a new channel or if LinkedIn ceases to exist, I'm very confident that like give me two, three months and I will be mm -hmm. there again with some new things that are actually based on the real knowledge, like how to stand out online or how to grow your business online. That's basically yeah. what I do. Yeah. And that is why I wanted to have this conversation now, because I'm really seeing that change on, uh, on your profile and how you communicate with your audience, which is how many people, how many followers do you have? Over a hundred, almost 200 K? followers mm, yeah, one 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 forty four one forty five thousand yeah, 000, yeah okay like after that. this podcast is it will be 200k it will, exp it will, it will explode but it's funny <laughs> it, 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 it's funny because i remember celebrating fifty thousand, which yeah. was one september uh 2022 yeah wow. uh, i was on fifty thousand, and it, yeah. took, it so imagine i'm on linkedin since 2005 so here you see like almost one hundred thousand in in almost like around 12 months yeah, and and that's that's the moment I I met you online as well. It was at, at the point that you published the um, LinkedIn algorithm report of 2022. It was the first time you came in my feed. You appeared okay. in my feed. So it took me very uh, long. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> but I wasn't missing you. I just just didn't know you. <laughs> now you. I would Thank be missing. You. Now I would be missing you <laughs> and your content, of course. So um, so you appeared the LinkedIn. Uh, algorithm report and i really was flabbergasted first of all this was an immense report 
-hmm. It was huge. The content mm -hmm. you were sharing, the insights, the value, you were just giving it away for mm -hmm. nothing. Mm -hmm. Even more, you, you motivated your uh, readers to share, to use it, to interpret it, to mm -hmm. um, summarize it, to be creative with it. And I said, why does someone does that? Because this is worth money. <laughs> And you're just giving it away. So I mm -hmm. started following you to see how you would follow up on all these reposting and sharing. And you just wanted to see if I'm crazy or something. Yes, like that. what is like, happening this to this guy? Why? Yeah. What is? It? What is his strategy? <laughs> Why? So yeah. and that fascinated me. And um, I saw your following explode. It was immense. So tell me, what was the strategy of that report? Well, it wouldn't be a real joke now if I said there is no strategy, but <laughs> no, that's not no. completely true. It's too that's much of a work. True. It's too much no, of a that's work. Not, no, no, that's not completely true. But imagine, um, like, you know, my core business is not writing an algorithm report. My core business is to train marketing teams, sales teams, mainly of the bigger companies in order to like leverage LinkedIn for business growth. And imagine me saying to all those marketing teams, stop gating your content. Like knowledge is free accessible on the internet. It's what you do with the knowledge and how you guide your clients in implementing your knowledge into mm -hmm. their own processes. That's what people are paying you for. Imagine me telling that to every single client, even mentioning in, in, in post. And then when I release the algorithm report, I'm going to gate the content on a website. Mm -hmm. that, so that's the first thing. I, I, that would be like a huge disqualifier for my yeah. own strategy. So, so that's the first thing. Second, um, we started, although you saw me first to 2022, the first algorithm report was 20, uh, 2019, okay? Oh, yeah. It was not 57 pages. It, I think it were like 11 or 12 pages, okay? Basically, because some of our corporate clients ask us questions about reach. Mm -hmm. Why does my white paper get 5,000 likes? Why does my picture of my team get 30,000 likes? And we want to swap those two. And then we, we know from our own experience what happened, but we couldn't bag it up with facts. We couldn't bag it up. So we could say like, yeah, we've seen the same, but we couldn't explain. So, and it was May. And I always know July, August is a very quiet month because all everybody's going on holiday. And then I met this uh, wonderful guy who said like, okay, uh, I can create a student team and I can like do some research if you want. So I, I literally throwed some questions and he went like, with some tooling he has, and he brought back like the first thing. So we published it again without strategy because we shared it with our clients and they went like, they oh, 11 pages. They went already like, ah, oh, wow, this is really cool. And then I just thought like, okay, just publish it on LinkedIn, see what happens. It really went like this, no plan, just like we did the work, so why not publish it? And this was the first time my post reached more than uh, half a million views on my own profile. So I was like, wow, okay, so apparently like, and then, you know, I saw an increase. I don't know how much. I think it was 1,000, 2,000 followers. Not, not really, big, but it was doing well. Still no strategy. And then eight, nine months later, people came into my inbox saying like, hey, Richard, are you going to do the report again this year? Because we've seen some changes. And that was the moment I realized like, what? wait a minute. We already have the process in place. And if we are going to do it, we can also make a comparison with last year. So why not do it? And that was the first time that occurred to me, like, okay, people are looking for this. And if we update it, hence, fast forward to 2022, when we had a 57 page and much more mm -hmm. research. Um, and then, obviously, I do not remember how many messages I got from marketing experts who said, like, no, 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 no. You need to team with me and we are going to put that on a specific website where we generate emails, where we're going to follow up with like offers and because you're giving away all this for nothing. And I up until today, I still said, thank you for that. But no, our strategy is to give it away for free and to make people talk about it in a good way, Yanka, uh, Yanka mm -hmm. because I don't care if somebody translated into French or Chinese or Arabic, as long as they credit us and say like, okay, the original comes from Richard Van der Blom or Just Connect or whatever, okay? Um, and that has happened a lot. And I did, for example, uh, the algorithm report we launched last year, which you saw, 
brought me an additional 20,000 followers just with one document and a few other posts around the, the bus. Mm -hmm. I think only four or 5,000 came from my own post. And more than 75% came from all the posts that other people made referring to the same piece yeah. of content. And what happened next, if you talk about lead generation, we landed some very, very big enterprise uh, companies where someone from marketing, someone from sales, someone from whatever department saw this report, forwarded it internally and said like, hey, we need this guy for a company. So. Mm -hmm. For me, that's the strategy. Make people talk about your content, make people refer to you as the trusted advisor and conversion will come on itself. Yeah, but you took a lot of time and energy to follow up on all those posts who, who credited you and did something with your content. You took the time to, to give a comment. To, to the give good some ones value, and the bad ones. The good yeah. ones and the bad because you yeah. dare to be very critical and, and, and leave a... <laughs> I leave I'm, a... I'm Dutch. I don't know if that. I always make a joke when I when I when I'm internationally active. So I always say, even if, when I was on the U.S. stage, um, I got a question <laughs> from somebody in the audience who said, "Like I've always heard there are no stupid questions." Uh, so I and I said, "No, there are no stupid questions, but there are stupid people." And I said that on stage, and I was like, "Uh oh!" Uh -oh. <laughs> and luckily, the, like the audience was. They were yeah. laughing, you know, but, yeah. and then I said, I'm sorry for that, but I'm Dutch. I'm always yeah. very honest. And, and some people say blunt. Um, and I know, Ianka, that maybe 90% of the people, they value this and they see this as an authentic part of me, mm -hmm. which I think authenticity is one of the most important aspects of being a thought leader. Mm -hmm. Okay. But 10%, they, they really hate my guts. And they're not going to tell me directly. Some of them are, but I think the majority are not going to tell me directly. But they might refer to this guy like, oh, he's always arrogant or he's always very direct. Yeah. In all fairness, um, if I would only reach out to the bad ones and say like, hey, you didn't mention me. Hey, this is, they might have a point. But like you mentioned, I also reach out to like hundreds of people making an effort to translate or create a carousel or just refer and say, Thank you for the mention. Appreciate it. Thank you for the work you put into the translation. Very much appreciated. So yeah. I think in that case, I'm, I'm quite good balanced. Yeah. Yeah. So now the, the, the first couple of months I, when I started following you, I mostly read um, how to content, how to do this, do that, uh, et cetera. And the last few months I'm seeing a shift in, in your content. I'm really feeling that you are transforming into the thought leader um, a a persona, that you are shifting your content and shifting your views, not, not necessarily your views, but you have other topics, more umbrella topics. Like you say, it's not, mm -hmm. it's not a tool anymore. It's about the marketing or it's about mm -hmm. leadership. So mm -hmm. um, is, that, is that a consequence of, of growing that audience of becoming known worldwide, being asked for key, to bring keynotes, to be asked to become a podcast guest, etc. Is is that how it works? Oh yeah, I think I think definitely. And again, um, I do a lot of things on intuition. So sometimes I do things without actually like really knowing rationally why I do things. There, a few things happened. So first of all, if LinkedIn has a new feature tomorrow. I don't care about making a post. I can make a post about a new feature, but I don't want num being person number 200 on the yeah. same day who creates a, pic a, a, yes. a post on that feature because you cannot distinguish yourself yeah. amongst all the others that have exactly the same good content. No? So one of the things that occurred to me that, I, okay, if I want to step up my own brand, then I have people in our company who still post these things, but they are in a different stage of their journey okay so they need to publish the how-to because there's nothing wrong with how-to content it depends mm -hmm. on your goals and how yeah. you want to position yourself yeah secondly i notice that i get about 100 plus messages on linkedin a day which is like crazy it's like very difficult to manage but uh, they also inspire me because I get a lot of really good questions. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that also the questions that I receive change from more like, where is this button? How can I upload my picture like five years ago to like, mm -hmm. okay, this is our goal. This is our target audience. We noticed this. 
what would be the right content strategy or what would be so based on those questions i also started to adapt my content like not how to but more or, like you said on a strategic level like more on uh even maybe the platform doesn't care but this is the attitude this is the process you need to be in place to like and then there is another thing that i think that in order to really grow your brand on linkedin your followers um you need to diversify your content. Mm-hmm. Um, so I really made an effort. Um, I started with, uh, in December, I had our video guy coming to Valencia. We recorded 24 uh, couch talks. Yeah, you know, I it saw was, those. Yeah. And those was video. And this is really out of my comfort zone because mm-hmm. I like to be on stage, but I'm very bad with scripted things. Mm-hmm. Um, and he convinced me to do it. And in all fairness, they got really good traction on LinkedIn. And people said, hey, finally, we see you speaking because yes. we only know you from written text. Mm-hmm. Um, I started to, uh, like the quote you just mentioned, I started to share quotes. But not quotes from, I don't know, Seth Godin or Richard Branson or Elon, Elon Musk. No, I, I started to share my own quotes that I think, like, okay, this is something that I believe in. Or this is my viewpoint on this. And I see that also those quotes resonate with a lot of people. Um, so, yeah, it, 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 the change you have seen is, I think, for 70%, a change that I am perfectly aware of, that I'm working on with my content team on my strategy. But it's also for 30% because of the different questions, different responses, different engagement I get from my network. Yeah, it's because your positioning is changing. You're turning the from you're um, transforming from being the expert towards becoming the thought leader and the one who knows not just LinkedIn as a tool, but how to yeah. um, how to leverage your reputation online. Yeah, and and one of the good things, and this is this is something that I really want to share in this uh, uh, podcast, also also with your viewers, because I know you talk about personal brand leadership, is that. You will be amazed if you if you reach a certain level of thought leadership on how easy it becomes to start conversations mm-hmm. with target audience. Mm-hmm. I I can now literally send a message to a CEO or a CEO, and if they have known me or if they follow me, like yesterday I had a meeting with a, a US based company. It was the head of sales. It was the head of marketing. It was the head of business development, okay? And the head of the business development started the discussion with Richard. Before we start, I just want to say I'm a huge fan of you. I've been following <laughs> you since November 2022. It's an honor to talk with you. And I'm talking about like one of the decision makers in a company with over 2,000 employees. Yeah. So wow. this is more or less like what I think thought leadership does with you. Mm-hmm. So you become like one of them or maybe like a valued, trusted advisor, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if you're not there and you try to reach out to those people, you get ignored or people go like, nah, you know, he's yeah. trying to sell us something. So you will be amazed of the impact of a good thought leadership in, mm-hmm. in, in networking, but also generating business. Yeah. But I heard you mentioning the word content team, yeah. <laughs> which is the magical word for a lot of uh, people on uh, on LinkedIn who don't have that content team, but do need a content creation machine. So take us, uh, share us your journey in, in how you started your content creation machine and from, uh, from you only doing the job towards having uh, someone who does this, someone who does that. Yeah, I mentioned a team because it sounds cool. It's not really <laughs> a team, but it sounds cool. Um, but, but, you know, I'm not doing everything alone anymore simply because I don't, I, I like the time. Um, there's an important, again, there's an important focus change I made when the pandemic started, 2022, because before, 2021, before, um, before that, I had about 70% of my content in Dutch and about 30% in English, okay? Because at that time, I was focusing mainly on like Benelux market, Belgium, Holland, mm-hmm. because I traveled a lot to Belgium, Holland to do my like on-site trainings. And then I started to think and like in my quest for repositioning i thought like if i if i start to from now on just tell myself everything that goes out is in english Mm -hmm. at least you have a bigger reach okay and in that case and i really hate that i'm that i'm saying this but in that case the pandemic was like for me very beneficial 
because that was the time that companies started like, okay, we don't need someone that is near our office that can jump in because it's not allowed. So if the guy is in Holland or in Spain, it doesn't matter as long as he can perform online. Okay. So that combination of me sending out content in English and more people, more companies getting acquainted to online sessions really boosted my business. Mm -hmm. Um, it also made that I grew my brand and that people get higher expectations <laughs> instead of this guy, like posting three times a week. Now they were looking like, okay, but we want more. So I stepped up my frequency at that moment. I'm on six, maybe seven times a week. So wow. sometimes I'm not there. If you don't see a post of me on some day, in 90% of the cases, it's because my post of the day before is performing so well yeah. that I didn't, that I don't want to distract my audience by getting a new piece of content because a new piece of content always gets prioritized over like all the content. So is, is that one of the reasons why don't you don't automate your scheduling? Yeah. Yeah. Just to yeah. be very. Yeah. Uh, That's the, the first one. And, yeah. Okay. That's the first one. The second one. Um, like I always publish in the morning between mm -hmm. eight and 10 Europe time zone. I always publish myself, never via a scheduling tool. And just before and just after I publish, I engage with my peers. Yeah. Okay. Because simply if LinkedIn sees that you're active, they reward you with more, like more visibility. Going back to my content strategy. Um, as we follow the, the algorithm report, you know, we would be very stupid not to implement all the learnings in our own content strategy. So I saw, for example, that document posts, you know, the PDF mm -hmm. posts get much more traction. <laughs> I challenge you to go back to my post from 2021, where I did myself in PowerPoint, my own design. And it looked like, well, I cannot yeah. mention the name, but it looked horrible. Okay. Because I'm not a designer. And even some people in my team who know me long, they were very honest. Hey, Richard, like, you cannot do that. You cannot, like, the color is off. You have different fonts. Like, yeah. you know, this is like not even student stuff, you know? Stud students would be very, like, uh, how do you say, offended, if, if you would call it this. So um, then I went on a search, like, okay, I need someone who understands more or less a bit of the business, who, who understands the design, but also who is willing to create or to strengthen my brand okay because until 2021 everything i did was just connecting branded and i spare you all the details but i ended up searching on linkedin for someone and i just went into my own feed looking at people that provided very cool carousels like okay and then just sending the people a message say like hey i really like your carousel tell me like what is your day job? How do you earn, how do you make your money? What is your goal? Who are your clients? And I ended up with um, Noyesa. She's from the Philippines. She's now working more than a year with us, who I found on LinkedIn because she created an awesome visual. Yeah. And she said, like, no, I'm a visual designer. I'm a social media like uh, a consultant. I have my own business in the Philippines. And I said, well, can you have an additional client? And she says, like, yeah, but for how many hours? So what about full time? And she said, oh, oh, yeah, 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 that, that, that's really cool. But I still have some little clients. I said, I don't care. I'm not going to control if you work 40 hours. I just want the output. And you know, and that's that's actually what happens now. So if you see any of the carousels, and, and I still think a lot of them are amazing. And I get a lot of questions like, wow, Richard, can you teach us? No, I can because I don't have a clue. Um, I, I always, or not, maybe not always, but very often if, People in the comment say like, wow, I like the design. I reply and say, all kudos to Nyesa, okay, because mm -hmm. I'm not a designer. Um, so, so that's the first one of our team. Um, and she also helped to launch my Richard Vanderblom brand because if I do keynotes, I don't like to do them under just connecting mm -hmm. because that's the different. So it's me. Uh, she helped me to create like my personal website, think about logos, think about how. So that's one of the team. and then. In our hub of 15 people, so in the Just Connecting hub, we have a lot of people that are dedicated to LinkedIn. And if you look at the Just Connecting page, for example, we use the input of many because like we have different people with different expertises. And sometimes I also just borrow like a slide deck that a, that a colleague made where I go like, wow, this is a really cool topic. Let's, I'm not reposting it, I'm reusing it. Mm -hmm. So th that's also a team. And then, and I don't know if I, I also included like AI in my team. I, <laughs> I, I'm very against yeah. throwing all things in AI, create yeah. a post, and then without 
editing, just publish it. I'm against that. But I have seen over the past month, my engagement increase, my conversion increase when I use ChatGPT to for above all, correct my native English because I'm not native English. Mm -hmm. Second, implement a certain style that I like, that I really are, but I cannot write in that style in my non-native language. And third, about restructuring some of the things because I'm still writing all my posts, Ianka, and I don't do much than six, seven minutes per post. So I start writing, I throw like, I empty my head and then normally I would publish it. And now I go to like ChatGPT or WordTune and I go like, okay, can you rephrase this that you have like a style where you start with this stuff? So it's my text rephrased by AI. Mm -hmm. And then I, I get it back. I look at last time, maybe I change some things and then I publish it. So that's the entire team. Yeah. yeah. I like the way you addressed AI a bit. Prudence with, <laughs> should I say it? Should I mention it? Yeah. Is it done yeah. or is it not done? But I should mention it because it's a hype. It's a trend. You should be on it. Uh, but how uh, how will we deal with it, etc.? It's it's a big question um, to me. I think I think it's it's an interesting tool, but um, it's for me the the biggest question will be is how to create and find your identity using AI and not creating. Uh, I think an, that's impossible. A cyber, think, a cyber think, identity. Yeah, and I think that's impossible. If if you're going to use AI and maybe AI, and I'm not an AI, AI expert, far from, mm -hmm. but I think it's impossible for AI to find your identity. Your identity is something you no, have. Yeah, sorry, I'm, 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 it's not what I meant. It's it's um, it's how you how, how many, keep but, authentic. Yes, stay authentic yes. when using AI. I think that's the, that's a true challenge because, in all fairness, if I if I take my my own writing and I throw it into ChatGPT and I say correct for grammar and implement this style, the outcome is not me. It's that's, not what like, okay, that, that's what I mean. That that's what I mean, and that's no. what I'm already seeing on LinkedIn. I see people post text, and I'm immediately thinking that's ChatGPT. That's yeah. the same output. It's it's a template. It's a script, and exactly. it's it's not authentic. No, and I see this also happening in the commenting because, you know, um, there is a lot of software now being launched that auto-comments, auto-engages for you. Yes. So you just copy the URL of a LinkedIn post uh, or multiple LinkedIn posts and you just say like, okay, comment like me. Yeah. Uh, and then you get, and I really instantly see if somebody comments yeah. on my post with ChatGPT because the wording, the use of words, the sequence it's it's not like humanly written. Yeah. Okay? So so last question, and and maybe it's the most important question at this point of the conversation is, you said LinkedIn is a people to people platform, but if so many people start writing or using AI, what is a people to people platform? Is it still that? Is this I'm, I'm, is this I'm, the I'm, end of social media because it's not the networking human to human anymore? It's just AIs talking to each other? Well, it's, it's, it's a very good question that is at the back of my head already for many weeks. Um, and I like to end positive. So let's say there <laughs> is still hope. But I do worry a bit. I mean, if you look at LinkedIn and maybe people that are relatively new to the platform, not not new to my, but new to the platform. So people who signed up, let's say from 2020 and onwards, they don't see the change, okay? They think yeah. like, it's like this. Yes. But somebody like me and probably somebody like you, if I look at LinkedIn now, I go like, okay, there is a rise of engagement bots, okay? Mm -hmm. A rise of people manipulating, mm -hmm. uh, having other people make 10 comments a day on their posts just for the pure sake of vanity metrics. We want to have more reach. There's a rise of automation invites. Software used to like yeah. identify 100 clients and send them automated invites, which ruins the trust of the platform. Because if I'm a CEO and every day I get four spammy messages of people trying to sell me one, I may be going to ignore the first three months. Then I may be going to change my settings that I'm not willing to receive them anymore. Also. I'm not the good, ones. the good ones anymore. 
And then if it doesn't stop, what's next? I might leave the platform and go like, hey, this is a spam tool. I don't want to be a sitting yeah. duck, so I leave the platform. Then we have LinkedIn because they recognize the importance of AI. It's not a hype. It's something that is going to stay. So yeah. they need to have something there. But I'm not very enthusiastic about saying like, okay, write 30 words and we create a post because a lot of people are either lazy or they lack time. Okay, that's a difference. Lazy mm -hmm. is attitude, lack time, you have other priorities. But both of them, they throw in 30 words, they get a post and they will post it without editing, without making them. So it could be well possible in the near future, a serious percentage of the content is written by AI, a serious percentage of your comments is written by AI commenting tools, And then instead of P2P platform that I really value, it becomes a bot to bot platform. And I don't know if LinkedIn and LinkedIn, like we're talking now, like it's one entity, but of course there are like thousand people working at LinkedIn with different departments, different like uh, responsibilities. But I don't know if they are aware enough yes. of the risks yeah. that they are taking by allowing bots, allowing automation, sending AI features to that platform mm -hmm. without knowing that 98% of the people will probably not use them in the right way. So yeah. I think there is a serious risk of trust and credibility in the near future for LinkedIn. Yeah, I completely agree. So I'm, I'm really happy you, co you confirm what I was feeling because I'm not a LinkedIn expert. So, okay. Um, thank you for this conversation.